up next on Eco Company. Powering up with fuel cells. We go to Connecticut to see the future of fuel cells right now. This isn't something that might happen or that could happen. This is something that is happening now. It's current and it's real. We go inside a place where the future of green tech energy is here today. Then developing a new wonder nut. Could this be the new source for biofuel? Well, as you can see, you're surrounded by hazelnuts. These are ones that we've actually harvested out on the field. Developing a hybrid hazelnut as a crop of the future. And being a good neighbor. But this isn't just loaning a cup of sugar. My name is Dave, and Dave. this is Jeff. How are you doing, Jeff? Hi, Jeff. We're with the Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge nice here for the lighting visit. Well, come on in. Well, thank you very much. It's about doing your part to save energy, and these guys are here to help one community do just that. Those amazing stories and a lot more coming up on Eco Company, starting right now. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Josh. And I'm Jelena. And today we're all about energy and renewable fuel. Yep, the race is on to develop renewable, clean energy to power our future. And on a recent trip to the state of Connecticut, we discovered that the future is right now. We're talking fuel cells. It's a clean, green energy, and we're checking it out. You've heard of fuel cells powering cars. Clean, green power that's zero emission. But did you know they can also power a whole lot more? And by a whole lot more, we mean power plants. This isn't something that might happen or that could happen. This is something that is happening now. It's current and it's real. Neil Aiello is giving us the scoop at Fuel Cell Energy in Torrington, Connecticut. It's where they're building these, giant boxes packed with shiny objects. And yep, we're talking fuel cells. So fundamentally, what is a fuel cell? Fuel cell is a very clean way, very environmentally friendly way to produce electricity without the combustion process. Here's how a fuel cell works. You take hydrogen and oxygen at a high temperature, cross it past electrodes, and presto, out comes electricity. And the best part? You also get water and heat out of the deal. But there's a big difference from the ones they're manufacturing here and the ones used in cars. We make our own hydrogen from natural gas or biogas. We can run on any fuel, uh, any carbon fuel. Cars, on the other hand, don't make hydrogen, and that's why they need these. But the basic idea is the same. What makes this clean energy? Uh, the fact that it's an electrical chemical process, we're not actually combusting the fuel, we're directly converting it into electricity. It's a 360 degree turn from using fossil fuels. Currently, the norm for producing electricity is what you would call it, maybe a large coal-fired plant that might make 700 megawatt of electrical production. Problem is, it's burning coal, it's polluting the air. This plant makes the fuel cell modules. It's a process that takes a lot of precision and automation. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. If it doesn't fit right, then it's not gonna come out right. Anthony Frankel makes sure things run smoothly, and that includes keeping an eye on robots. How heavy is one of those plates right there? Well, the actual fixture yeah. is about 250 pounds, approximately, so yeah. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> All right, best that we leave it to the robots. Yeah, 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 you don't, <laughs> you don't want to be hauling that around. <laughs> After you get the fuel cell assembled, it heads here. So this is the final assembly. Can you tell me what's going on right here? Sure. Uh, this is the area where the cell packages that we saw being made earlier will come. Uh, they've had all the components assembled into them, and they're ready for stacking. They compress a bunch of fuel cells together like this, and in the end, you've got a tower of fuel cells ready for action. How many uh, fuel cells are in? We have 400 cell packages in each one of our fuel cell stacks. Okay, and what kind of energy does that produce? Uh, this stack here will produce 350 kilowatts, which is about enough energy to power 200 houses. So what if you want to generate for more than 200 houses? Well, come on and I'll show you. Okay. 
All right, so you asked for more power, here it is. Uh, we'll take four of those stacks and put them inside one module, and then you get four times the power. So all those stacks go into something that looks like this. This is a module? Yeah, this is our C1400 module. Uh, it produces 1.4 megawatts, which is roughly 12, 1,200 average size homes. Put a bunch of these together, like you see here, and you get small power generation. So you can take these uh, modules of 1.4 megawatts and team them up into fuel cell farms. So what are we looking at here? This is a remote connection to a fuel cell power plant in South Korea. It's producing 2.8 megawatts of clean energy as part of an installation in South Korea that's the largest fuel cell installation on the planet. It's clean, green energy, and the sky's the limit. If it's environmentally good, it can't go wrong. I want the message to be that they're here now, they're real, there's no need to wait, there's nothing left to wait for. It's the future at our fingertips right now. Coming up, creating a new hybrid crop. We visit Arbor Day Farms to find out about the new Wonder Nut. We have a program where we're trying to make hazelnuts so that they will grow around the world. Making a hybrid hazelnut as a crop of the future. Plus, how to be a good neighbor and save energy at the same time. My name is Dave, and this is Jeff. How are you doing, Jeff? Hi, Jeff. We're with the Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge nice here for a delighting visit. More Eco Company is coming up. Up next, we travel to another part of the country. We visit Nebraska's Arbor Day Farm, where they celebrate trees and the bounty they provide. But there's more going on than meets the eye. Behind the scenes, they're developing a new Wonder Nut, an important energy crop of the future. University of Nebraska student Anna Ripa tells us more. I'm in Nebraska City, Nebraska, home to the Arbor Day Farm. And this is the home of Jay Sterling Morton, the founder of Arbor Day. This National Historical Park is inspiring people to celebrate trees and a whole lot more. From tree adventures to orchards and colorful leaves every which direction. If you want to learn about trees, you've come to the right place. The Arbor Day Farm is part of the legacy left behind by Jay Sterling Morton. He was U.S. Secretary of Agriculture under President Grover Cleveland and he founded Arbor Day in 1872. This was all the original working farm, cattle, trees, all that stuff of Jay Sterling Morton's original farm and rancher. Nothing short of nature's paradise, everything here has a purpose, and that's to inspire people to celebrate, nurture, and plant trees. Plus, there's something else going on here too. Did I mention the hazelnut project? That's what's going on inside this greenhouse. Let's go inside and take a look. These aren't leafy greens you're looking at, they're hazelnut seedlings, and this greenhouse is full of them. Well, as you can see, you're surrounded by hazelnuts. These are ones that we've actually harvested out on the field. It's a wonder nut that Arbor Day Farm VP Doug Farrar says could be coming into its own with a little help. We have a program where we're trying to make hazelnuts so that they will grow around the world fundamentally. By we, he means the Hybrid Hazelnut Consortium. It's the Arbor Day Foundation and a group of institutions hoping to unleash the hazelnut's full potential, not just as a food crop, but also as a biofuel. You know, we really believe that this will affect the world in a positive way. Okay, before we go any further, why do they think the hazelnut is so great? Well, it produces more oil per acre than soybeans used for biodiesel. It doesn't need much water. And its shrub is dense, so it's great for protecting habitats. Plus, plant the crop once and you can pretty much call it a day. Nebraska's chief forester, Scott Josiah, couldn't be more excited about all the above. To be able to grow a biofuel, a biodiesel, at twice the rate that we can with soybeans on a perennial crop where we're not disturbing the ground every year and do that on lands that are not growing food right now. That's exciting. 
Now for the challenge, growing them commercially in the Midwest or even the United States. Arbor Day Farms' Adam Howard gives us the stats. 97% of the hazelnuts are grown outside of the U.S. We have a 3% market share in the states, and that 3% market share is only in the state of Oregon currently. The problem is that while the European nut is a larger, high-quality nut, it's picky about where it lives and not too disease-resistant. Their American version is the opposite. European in my right hand, American in my left, much smaller, not commercial at all, but this is resistant to what's called Eastern Filbert blight, a, a deadly disease which just kills this. The solution, according to the University of Nebraska researchers at the Arbor Day Farm, plus the consortium partners Rutgers and Oregon State, is to combine the two. We want to find hazel, hybrid hazelnuts. That's a mix of kind of two kinds of hazelnuts, to not get too scientific. We find the best one with the best nuts, the best one that grows in the best region. Put those two together, that's the ma and the pa, and see what the kids are. <laughs> The perfect kid will be disease and cold resistant, thrive almost anywhere, and become a competitive crop. You'll see cornfields and soybeans being replaced by hazelnuts. You plant them once and they grow for 25 years. These hybrid shrubs you see in the orchard are the hybrid parents. Their offspring end up in the Arbor Day nursery run by Adam Howard. We have three crops per year that we grow and we produce about, we can produce up to 50,000 hazelnuts in each crop. We're trying to find that funny plant out there that was a ma and pa that just was a superstar. A superstar that could make us think of nuts in a whole new way. Why is the hazelnut project important? You know, um, as we look at the world and we look at the energy savings that need to be, when we look at the major things of water, this will, will make water cleaner for watersheds. This will sequest carbon, so it keeps carbon from going into the atmosphere. So from environmental sustainability to biofuel and the food we eat, researchers encourage budding scientists to take note. Young people that are interested in, in making a difference, this is a, one area that when we could really make a difference. This could become the third crop for the United States in terms of the Midwest. It could be corn, soybeans, and hazelnuts. Something to chew on as the hazelnut comes into its own. Well, it's time to open up the Ecolingo Dictionary. We hear a lot about the two Bs. Biomass and biofuels. But what exactly are we talking about here? Well, biomass is organic material made from plants, grasses, and even wood, all of which contain stored energy from the sun. That stored energy can be used to create biofuels. Take corn and sugar cane. It can be fermented to produce the biofuel ethanol. Vegetable oils and leftover grease are used to make biodiesel. You can even turn landfill waste into a biofuel. Organic waste emits methane as it decomposes, and that can be used to make biogas. Biomass and biofuels. Know the eco-lingo and be a part of the solution. Up next, how these guys are taking matters into their own hands. This map represents all the people who have signed up for clean energy. They're getting their whole town on the bandwagon. More Eco Company is straight ahead. Who doesn't love a good neighbor? And who says neighbors have to live right next door? The Connecticut Project Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge are bringing people together across the state. It's an effort to green up homes and save energy. Meet the crew behind Neighbor to Neighbor, eco-warriors with one thing on their mind. Bringing down our CO2 emissions and um, slowing down global warming. And they're doing just that by helping the rest of us wise up in the energy department. What is the Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge? Okay, so the Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge, we actually won a grant from the U.S. Department of Energy to run an energy efficiency pilot in the state of Connecticut. And our goal is to help residents reduce energy consumption. So we're working in 14 towns throughout the state, and our overall goal is to reduce energy consumption by 20%. Because everyone uploaded all their documents onto Dropbox, any, anything that you created in the last eight months. Jessica Bergman with the nonprofit Clean Water Action team helps organize the program. Well, the core itself, we're all recent college graduates. We have a pretty young team, so it's really exciting for us to be involved in a program like this. They're from all over the U.S., but share a passion for helping the planet. In school, I really wanted to figure out how to go green. Uh, it's kind of hard to know what to do, but after some basic reading, uh, 
found out that Connecticut had this great opportunity and energy efficiency is really one of the best ways to make a difference. So what's one of the easiest ways to green up your energy use? Switching out these. Evan, this is a lot of light bulbs. Tell me where these are from and how you collected them. Well, this is quite a few light bulbs. Um, after we complete a lighting visit, we bring them all back to the office to recycle. This is probably from between 10 to 20 visits. And uh, overall, I think we've done about 150 visits, so we've changed thousands of light bulbs. This is a lighting box. And as Anastasia Rogit shows us, a bulb isn't just a bulb around here. OK, let's go through these three different types of light bulbs, starting with this one. This is your traditional incandescent bulb. It's the least efficient bulb that you can have now in the market. All right, let's go into this one, the middle one. This is the complex fluorescent bulb. Um, which is 70% more efficient. And then most efficient is the LED bulb, which is 90% more efficient than your incandescent bulb, um, but it's a little bit more costly. Um, and actually, you can, you can see that they all have really nice equivalent warm light outputs. Today, Jeff Crawford and David Mayer are braving the rain to head to Portland, Connecticut. It's a town that's already doing a lot when it comes to saving energy. First, select woman Susan Bransfield tells us about its Clean Energy Task Force. They're volunteers in our town. They're people that are very committed to the whole concept and the living of clean energy. This map represents all the people who have signed up for clean energy. We're very thankful to the people that serve on our Clean Energy Task Force. And we're very proud of ourselves because we learn from neighbor to neighbor. We learn from each other how important it is to have clean energy and to be so ecologically knowledgeable and live it as well. Hi Thatcher family, you guys are greening up your households. Are you ready to have those energy experts come in today? Yes. yes. All right, well I think they're outside so it's time to get started. Now the Thatcher family is doing its part. Hello, Hi. how you doing? Good. Great, my name is Dave and this is Jeff. How you doing Jeff? Hi Jeff. We're with the Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge here for the lighting visit. Well, come on in. Well, thank you very much. Where do you use the lights the most? The visit starts with a chat around the table. And then it's time to take a look around. So we have five what look like 60 watt um, incandescents and we're definitely going to make sure to change those out. Oh, you already have a CFL, so great. Now for the switcheroo. Let's go. Overall, it was a successful visit. We changed 11 bulbs. They found a couple of areas that we can improve on, and um, hopefully it'll contribute to some more savings throughout the year. So, Jesse, what do you think about your family going green? I think it's a really good improvement on uh, how much we have to pay and all that, because it takes a lot of power to have the air conditioners and all of our lights on at night. It's really nice to know that I, my parents don't have to pay that much anymore. It's actually the first step in the energy challenge. Really what we focus on is uh, major upgrades such as insulation, windows, more efficient furnaces because this is where you're going to see the most significant savings in the home. So what do you think of those people coming in today and changing all these light bulbs for you? Um, I think it was awesome. I mean, we really needed that, quite honestly. All right, you guys are all done. All the light bulbs are changed. How do you feel? Good. Brighter. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> a little brighter, a little lighter in the pocket. Yes, and better for the environment at the same time. Yes. Why do you think it's so important that young people are involved in this sort of clean energy movement? Um, I think it's really exciting because energy efficiency isn't something that you think of as being fun and sexy. I think it's really important because people look to us as influencers. So if we're excited about it, we can get our parents and our friends all invested in making a difference. It's a challenge these guys hope all of us will take on, one light bulb at a time. Did you know that the average home pollutes more than the average car? So saving electricity does more than save money for your family. It helps save the environment, too. Here are a few things we all can do to help conserve electricity. Done with your homework and IMing your friends? Put your computer to sleep or shut it down. A typical computer uses between 65 and 250 watts. Leaving it on is like leaving water running in the sink. You've heard it before, so what's stopping you? Replace all your incandescent lights with CFLs. CFLs use up to 75% less electricity. Finished with your latest rock band session? 
turn off your TV, video game, and other equipment when you leave the room. Saving energy is easy. Just power down everything when you're not using it. No matter what you do, be eco-wise and be part of the solution. You could be a part of Eco Company too. Create your own video. Shoot a story about being green. Or somebody doing something unique to help save the planet. Add some music and have some fun. Then upload your video at eco-company.tv. So join the company, Eco Company. And be a part of the solution. Well, that wraps up another episode of Eco Company. Thanks for watching. For more information on the stories in the show, or to give us your feedback, check out our website at eco-company.tv. And remember, you too can be part of the solution. We'll see you here next time on Eco Company.